and I'm going to say one, two, three. There we go. Okay. And we are recording. Here we go. Okay. Hello, Comic Universe. Uh, this is DPZ, and I'm here with our newcomer, The Real Manos. Hello, folks. It's me, The Real Manos. Yes. Uh, how are you enjoying your time at Universe? It's great. Uh, you guys have an amazing green room. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we put a lot of uh, time and effort into that. I can't stop lying. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, let's keep up the, let's keep up the, the dream for, for those watching. Like, oh, yeah, your, your bathroom is immense, and it's got these wonderful tray of gummy bears that someone, like, keeps re replenishing. It's good. It's a really nice channel. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, spared no expense. Um, but to, but no, I'm really enjoying it here. Yeah, uh, we're happy to have you on board. And this was actually something I wanted to do um, shortly after you joined, but um, I wanted to wait to let you acclimate to the channel. But um, yeah, so as for those who don't know, uh, if you didn't want, if you don't know who uh, the real Manos is, uh, Manos is a uh, writer of a comic by the name of Red Knight. He is also the author of Devita. And he has also done several other works. And I thought, because, hey, it's kind of a comic channel, how about I interview a, the guy who actually writes comics on the channel? That's, that's like a no-brainer, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> so It's a great idea. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> it's a great idea. I'm excited to be a part of it. <laughs> um, but this is one of my favorite underrated lines in Ghostbusters for some reason. I have quoted that many times in real life. I try to pull it out every time someone comes up with a good idea or a horribly bad idea. Yep. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, getting back to the interview, at the start of the interview, let's ask the obvious question. What made you wanted to, want to get into comics? And more importantly, what made you come up with the idea for Red Knight? I guess it started long ago when I was a kid. I absolutely loved comic books. Um, and when I was like, I don't, I don't know, I guess like seven or eight, I was making my own kind of comic books. Um, I was doing a lot of like, uh, you know, trying to tracing and putting together and trying to draw stuff. I'm, I'm a terrible artist, even as a kid and now as an adult. But I just kept wanting to write Spider-Man. So I was writing like my own Spider-Man comics. And I put it down. I grew up a little bit. In my teens, I started like wanting to do it again because I was getting back into comics. So I was making more fan comics, and I was still a terrible artist. But I had this idea. I had this neat idea that Spider-Man is probably in his mid twenties, so he meets like a younger superhero that is kind of inspired by him, and it, the idea would be it this kind of way of looking back like oh you know i always think of myself and always like like this younger hero and you know can't get enough respect and here's a bunch of heroes growing up after me who are kind of like inspired by me and the hero i had was uh todd mcclain who i originally called desert knight because he was from texas and he was going to be like this western hero um and I really liked what I was putting together for him. So I was like, oh, wait, I don't need the Spider-Man thing. Let, let me just make my own thing. And that's kind of where it started. And he eventually evolved. He changed his superhero name a couple times until I settled on Red Knight. And uh, that's the funny thing. Like, I've changed the, like, superhero name a couple times. But as the character, he's been this, pretty much been the same thing. Um, I moved locations. I moved him from Texas because I don't know anything about Texas. Um, I moved him to, um, my home here in Norfolk, Virginia, and kind of, like, uh, went from there. I have always loved comics, and I have been, uh, writing since I was a teen. I started writing plays as a teenager, and I very quickly, like, sidestep right into comics, because that's just where my, my love is. Okay, um, that's uh, that's pretty cool. So when you were designing Red Knight, um, and I think we talked about, if I vaguely remember, you and I talked about this a long time ago, um, and you, mm -hmm. you were like, uh, 
Yeah, that you just now brought that to my attention. The design of Red Knight looked a lot, it looked a little similar to Midnighter from, of course, Wildstorm. So, mm -hmm. so just to reiterate to those wondering, because I've seen this comment here and again on uh, Red Knight, is was the design, the costume design for Red Knight inspired by Midnighter? Uh, believe it or not, no. And there's actually. There are some inspirations, but it really wasn't Midnighter. If anything, um, once I looked at the character, I thought, oh, no, I hope people don't think I'm copying Midnighter. But, I mean, it literally wasn't from that. Um, at, when he was Desert Knight and Black Horse, uh, he had a cape. He always had a cape. I loved capes. I think they look cool on superheroes. I don't care what their reasoning is. I need a cape. And I would have lots of people tell me, well, the character doesn't need a cape and stuff like that. And, uh, and the Incredibles didn't help. So <laughs> um, when I sat down to kind of like, uh, uh, I guess I don't want to call reboot the character, but when I was kind of uh, kind of scraping away a lot of the things that was, wasn't working for the character when I was going to do it as Red Knight, the comic book, uh, I did a bunch of changes, and one of them was like, uh, I, I can't keep the cape. And... The trench coat thing just left, uh, just went. Uh, that was the instant thing I could think of because it does a lot of things visually. A cape does, but it's a little more practical. Uh, it has this own cool kind of vibe on its own. And I've always loved trench coats. I love that detective look, and I wear. <laughs> I tend to wear trench coats uh, myself. And to be honest, that in influence comes from. Uh, Lloyd Dobler from Say Anything, which was one of my favorite films. He oh. wears a trench coat all. Th he wears a trench coat all through that, and um, I saw that as like, geez, how old was I? Like nineteen when I saw that. I fell in love with trench coats, and uh, so yeah, that was kind of an easy decision to make. So I thought, okay, we'll put a superhero mask on him that looks like a you know pretty standard superhero mask you know with the jaw open and you know give him gloves the boots i thought of uh, in a belt i thought the idea of giving him like kind of like pant like pants and like a t-shirt made the costume look a little more homemade and then i'll throw a trench coat on him uh because i want the costume to look like okay i had some money but not too much money yeah and uh, <laughs> what it looks like if people could cosplay this they could do it <laughs> exactly yeah um because i pitched the character he he uh, he owns a local business um that he inherited from his parents and it's not like a huge industry like he's not bruce wayne and matter of fact i've often referred to him as batman on a budget like he has thousands of dollars he doesn't have millions or billions so he's, he's well okay. off he, essentially yeah he's okay he's middle class and um like he he is kind of a middle class hero and not a billionaire hero uh so yeah that's kind of reflected in his costume yeah. um may i ask and i i can't remember if we've had this conversation before but um for the people out there and uh, for their sake uh why the uh red horse design on the chest was were you it, was it like to meant to be a uh, chess piece design like i always kind of imagine yes, yes. Um, that has actually stuck with the character all through the revisions, uh, cause I always thought horses and knights were kind of like a cool image to use for a hero. And, um, let's see, we, yeah, I started with like the desert knight and I had a, he had a black, uh, chess piece symbol on his chest, like all across his chest. And then when I changed him up to black horse... The artist I was working with came up with this cool idea of coming up with a smaller symbol that was a clasp connecting his, like, jacket and costume. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay, that looked cool. And then when I went back and kind of uh, tweaked the character and, like, you know, figured out the new revisions for his look and design and stuff like that, I went back to uh, the chest piece all across his chest. And, you know, of course, with Red Knight, you know, that was, I had to tweak that, up, obviously. Uh, so yeah, it does come with, it does come with the idea of like you know heroes and knights, and he is he is a guy who uh, grew up with superheroes, 
and is very uh, romantic about that idea. Uh, and of course, you know, we do rant, uh, romanticize the idea of knights and samurais, uh, you know, cowboys and superheroes. So he is all in that. So he kind of uses that imagery. Yeah. I would love to, if this, I would love to see a Red Knight crossover with the boys, just to have that kind of, <laughs> that kind of disparity between. He would not like them. <laughs> <laughs> they would not get along. Yeah. Um, I do have actually. I do have up. Uh, these aren't written yet, but I do have down the line him coming across characters that are very anti superhero, uh, which is some, uh, which are some ideas I I definitely want to kind of incorporate. You know, just like, not everybody's not everybody's in on it. Like not everybody's think thinks this is great. Matter of fact, the first scene in the comic, he's having a kind of debate with. Uh, uh, his girlfriend, who thinks superheroes aren't that awesome, um, and you know he is totally in on the idea. He's all in on uh, superheroes. Um, so when you, because um, you've done interviews before and talked about this, your idea for Red Knight was that it was a optimistic superhero kind of living in a almost cynical world. Um, yeah, and um, has that always been like your view on comics like most of the days where it's like it just feels even from marvel and dc where it just feels so cynical sometimes or so like away from what it used to be um was that a lot of inspiration for doing the comic in this way it was um the early days of putting this character together for me was literally from like 90 1990 to 94 uh, that's kind of where I put together, you know, the whole Red Knight universe and the characters and kind of the mission statement for what I wanted this series to be like. And I know that's a while back, but that's kind of when I guess you could call it the Dark Age really exploded. And th that's my instant, This it was my instant reaction to that. And I keep thinking like, oh, you know, I hope this doesn't get dated. But no, this we still kind of have this butting of heads of what superheroes should be like. Because um, I'm a person who I, you know, if you read my stuff, I have some really dark <laughs> material I write about. I'm not afraid of uh, going dark uh, with like either superheroes or horror and, uh, and thrillers and stuff like that. But there's there's something about like a hero that tries to rise above it that I just, I'm always a sucker for. And I, I don't want to give, uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't give into that kind of like cynicism. I think you should be cyn uh, cynical to a point. I don't know. I guess you can call that a realist. And, um, he's a young optimistic person and, uh, he's not kind of blinded by it, which is something that I'm kind of proud of the way I write him. Um, like he knows, he knows there are things that are bad. You know, he knows that are, there are people who are flawed and stuff like that. He's not completely drinking the Kool-Aid on these ideas. Um, which I'm kind of proud of, uh, mm -hmm. because it's very easy to write someone who is just completely, you know, he's, he's not a boy scout, is what you're saying. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he's aware of things are bad and he's like, well, you know, if I stay true to this, you know, maybe I can change things. Yeah. Um, and the idea is, in the universe uh, that I'm writing, things went really south, really bad for the world and superheroes. And, you know, there's been a recovery. And he's inspired by the superheroes he grew up and the values he learned from them. Even though those heroes have grown old and become cynical and have become kind of sellouts. Some are, like, working for the government and just doing whatever job they get. And some are um, contractors who, you know, just make money off it. And he's kind of like the one who grew up believing. And he, in that way, I've, I've kind of, like, uh, build him as the last optimistic man in a cynical world. Because, you know, there are those who have just completely lost their, their optimism. Yeah. Um, and he's going to try and get it back. I mean, that's his... I don't think he's decided that, like, consciously, uh, but it's definitely on his to-do list. Okay, so 
uh, going back to my joke about the boys, it does have that kind of feel to it, um, but it's a more optimistic take. It's not nihilistic or, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's like if, um, I don't know, it's it's like the boys, but the lead character is Steven Universe, you know. I was going to say, like, the character from, uh, the Deku from My Hero Academia. Yeah, yeah, or something, yeah, like that, you know. Um, I think that's some of the misunderstanding about writing this kind of stuff, um, is that I think it's really interesting to put an optimistic character in a cynical story. And I, I think it gives you a lot of material to work with. Um, because you can, I, I like to write things where not everyone's 100% right. Um, it's very rare when someone's 100% right uh, on a particular subject. So uh, that's kind of the way I like to do things, at, uh, at least right now in the, in the series. All right. Um... So I like I guess like the the follow up question with that to be is um, the supporting characters. What was your kind of process creating the supporting cast for Red Knight? You know, I guess we'll talk about the um, the heroes, like the good the good guys first before we move on to the villains. And what was your process of making the villains? Of course, uh, I guess <clears throat> um, I keep forgetting like who I came up with first between Martha and Nathan, but I'm pretty sure Martha Brown was the first supporting character and. Her process started with, uh, she is a police detective in Norfolk, and her job is she works at a uh, department in the police department, uh, which uh, handles superhuman crimes. And that's a thing police departments across the country have to, like, set up, you know, to handle specific issues relating to these things. And the the Norfolk um, version of this is horribly uh, underfunded. Um, they just have enough to kind of keep it going, uh, but it's not deemed as important enough to really give the funds that it needs. And that's probably because Norfolk is a uh, very transient type of city. Uh, people come and go in this city a lot because it's a, a navy town. It's a port town. And if it was in a superhero universe, that would reflect that. There would be like these supervillains getting their asses kicked in New York, and they take a break like okay i gotta rebuild let me go where no one's looking oh norfolk let me go there <laughs> it's, and, it's rather than do the whole marvel thing of oh i gotta go rebuild myself in california yeah 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 oh um, yeah go somewhere that they're, they're not there i mean good lord how hard is that um so yeah there's like enough of a problem to maintain it but you know so she's this person who, like, her job is to arrest guys like Todd McClain, the Red Knight, because um, you have to have a, a license in this universe because, like I said, stuff went bad <laughs> and the laws had to change. Um, but he can't get a license because you either have to have a lot of money or just sign up with the government and they send you wherever. And he doesn't want to do either. He doesn't want to do either one of those. Um, so her first job is to really arrest him but she thinks it's actually a lot better of an idea if she kind of keeps this guy in her back pocket like i need a superhero for this situation and this guy needs training so you know her idea is that we'll help each other out my inspiration for her actually a lot of people talk about jim gordon and there's a, a bit of jim gordon in her but um my first thought was um uh Let's see, Captain Gene DeWolf in Spider-Man. I was about to say, I was about to say, uh, Gene DeWolf was probably the more bigger inspiration. It was. She was the initial uh, inspiration because I thought she was a really cool character, and they killed her off, and they never really like replaced her, and she doesn't have a costume, so she can't come back to life like anybody else. Oh, uh, <laughs> superhero! If you wear a stupid costume and have a name, then you can come back from the dead. But if you're just a regular person, forget it. You're you're gone forever. And it's, I always thought, oh, it was a shame they never replaced her, um, you know, with you know some other character. And that kind of started the ball rolling with uh, me creating this female character. And also she is, I don't know, I guess maybe the bigger influence on what I was doing with the character is uh, Bill oh. from The Greatest American Hero. Oh. 
Um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was in the middle of something. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, probably my biggest influence uh, is Bill from The Greatest American Hero. Because um, I don't know if you've watched that show, but I always thought that was a cool idea that this federal agent has a superhero works with him uh, <laughs> to help him out. It's like, oh, that sounds like an amazing idea. So that kind of was a big influence on that. She's not anything like Bill, but... Um, and then, of course, you know, then the Gordon thing. And, you know, sometimes I tell people, like, imagine if Jim Gordon was the one that gave Batman the orders versus, you know, the way it is, you know, now. And that's kind of where it is. Like, she is the one who kind of directs the missions and kind of helps Todd understand She's how to be chief. a hero. Yeah, yeah. And she is also someone who... So, uh, I'm sorry? No, I was just going to say, so she's more like Gene DeWolf meets Barbara Gordon. A little bit, yeah. Um, and she's also someone who was like, she was a lot more hopeful uh, when she was younger, and that's been kind of like ruined over the last few years. And they kind of help each other out in that way, where he, he's kind of helping her... Uh, I don't think they understand it yet, but he's kind of helping her regain like her sense of optimism, and he, and she's trying to teach him to just be a little bit more more aware and realistic. Uh, so the balance is right there. Uh, so she's actually grown over the years and become uh, like one of my favorite characters. So I can't really I can't really wait to get her out there. She's kind of my like. The, she's kind of the second supporting character that's really cool. She's kind of the Fonzie or the Wolverine of this series. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, yeah. Because whenever you brought up uh, Red Knight, Red Knight mm -hmm. uh, to the equation, like you would always be like Red Knight, dot, 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 and Martha Brown. Yeah. I um, always wanted to make sure of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I guess like the other superheroes of your universe, like I and I don't want to spoil it for any new readers who want to yeah. check this out for you. Um, the giant, oh, yeah, because sorry. we can't spoil everything you. for these. <laughs> oh, I'm, oh sorry. I'm sorry. I, uh, I, okay. lo I lost you. I... Oh, could you repeat that? Excuse me. Oh, could you repeat that? I lost you a little bit. Um, I was just gonna say. Um, so not to spoil anything about this giant event because that caused superheroes to be a little more cynical and caused the gun. But could you explain, like, what was kind of, like, your idea for, like, where, you know, how superheroes operate in here? I mean, obviously, some people are going to cry foul and go, like, oh, you just made the Superhero Registration Act. Um, but... Um, I fear when uh, kind of go like oh I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna, I was just gonna add like you uh, like you were building that universe and be like okay this is how this universe is gonna be set up and these are how these heroes are gonna operate post this event and um uh, yeah that was oh. yeah that was my fear oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that was my fear, because I actually already had come up with this idea of, of licensing and registration. And then Marvel did the Civil War story, and I thought, oh, crap, am I going to have to rewrite this whole universe and how it works? And luckily, Marvel d did what Marvel does and did it for like a year and a half and then forgot about it um, and didn't really delve too deep into it. And versus me, where I think that's the beginning, middle, and end of the story. And I, I'm more interested in exploring, like, how that kind of world works. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I guess that was kind of frustrating where, you know, they lost, you know, they stopped, they completely forgot the 50-state method. And I wanted to do this thing where, okay, what would be the inciting incident? And what would be uh, the people's reaction to that and how the government would respond? And how do corporations get involved? 
and one thing led to another. It was kind of building, building this. I, I kind of built it as a, I, I, I developed these stories, and uh, let's see. And that's something I definitely want to get into. Like you know, um, what's the advantage of being like a rich superhero, like a Batman or an Iron Man? Um, like what do you get to do where other superheroes, like a like a Spider Man or a Daredevil, uh, can't do? Uh, what if you don't have the advantages of like government sponsorship or, or money and you know what I, I, I was really uh, like inspired a lot by spider-man's renegade days uh, where he was constantly on the law like he beat the bad guys on the cop show and he's got to run too because he might get caught uh, I really like that idea and I really wanted to set up where, he, like, you know, he really wants to do this thing, but he has no choice but to do it slightly off the books. Um, because the inciting incident was terrible, and the reaction and the way uh, the government and corporations kind of rea uh, responded to it went too far to the extreme, and, of course, people are making money at the same time so you know it it causes this ripple effect where he you know has to kind of kind of figure out how to deal with being in this kind of universe and that's one of the things i really liked about uh, writing it because it causes more stories that's that's why i was found so i was relieved uh that marvel kind of just dropped it um uh, but you know as a fan i was also kind of disappointed that they really didn't dig into it either um, and well, heck, you know, that's the thing I want to do anyway. So let, let me just go deal, you know, deal with the idea. Yeah. I guess we'll have to wait for civil war three for any of that. Ugh. <laughs> It'll finally be good. Uh, uh, let's not kid ourselves. <laughs> um, <laughs> what if civil war three is really good after those two? Well, um, there is technically a civil war three and it was good and it, but it was a secret wars tie in. Oh, I don't know. Well, the way this has to go is um, the first one was uh, Iron Man and, and and Captain America fighting, and then of course, like you know, the writers threw Iron Man under the bus. Uh, and then the second one was Iron Man and Captain Marvel, and the writers threw Captain Marvel under the bus. So I guess the third one would have to be Captain Marvel and somebody else, and that other character is going to have to be the one that's you know, thrown under the bus. So I can't wait to see who that is. Yeah. Man, they really like, just, just to sidetrack, God, Civil War Two just damaged Carol like months before her movie. And that like, that had to have like, especially you pissed you off. Um, that's a dumb move. Yeah. Cause I, uh, cause I initially thought, well, cool. That's, that's a good idea. Making Carol one of the, you know, the big features of this arc because, you know, she has her movie coming up. So, you know, that's her stepping to the stage. And then Bendis does all that stuff with her. It's like, oh, jeez, man. What are you... I don't know. I just do not like the franchise. Um, I've heard people ask, like, is the second or third Captain Marvel movie going to be called Civil War 2? It's like, well, wait, you can't really do that because the first Civil War movie was a Captain America movie. <laughs> it's like... Uh, you can't really call it civil, Captain Marvel Civil War Two. That makes no sense. Um, so yeah. I would rather uh, just avoid, <laughs> just rather avoid the whole thing. <laughs> right. Um, so I guess like our my um, when we were talking about heroes and you know everything of world building with that. Now let's talk about the fun stuff. Let's talk about yeah. the process of making the villain. Yeah. Um... I loved rogues galleries, uh, the Batman, uh, the Spider-Man rogues galleries. Um, I think Wonder Woman's underrated. Um, and of course the Flash rogues gallery. That's always fun. And I, I think it's very important for the villains to be a reflection of the hero. Uh, at least that's the way I like to do it. And a lot of these characters that you'll see are <laughs> really really angry and violent um and creepy and scary in some respects um and they're all kind of characters that uh they're they're all kind of characters that um have no sense of optimism 
at all. They're all kind of like either doing it for the money or doing it uh, for some sense of like, yeah, power, but also some sense of self. Like, oh, I'm, I'm a really good person. That's why I'm going to dominate all these other people. Um, and, you know, that's where we get... Um, Let's see, there's some characters, I, I tried to kind of, I wanted to kind of create a rogues gallery of all the kind of evil villains I kind of like um, as best I can. Like there's, there's of course super villains, uh, there's mobsters, there's going to be a mad scientist, there's a creepy magical villain, there's a couple of them actually. Um, there are these um, uh, super villain, yep. I was actually gonna like a, like just throw this out here. I actually got like a villain idea for you to use for Red Knight, if you want to hear it. <laughs> okay, kid, what's your pitch? Uh, my care. The villain's name is Doctor Judas. Mm hmm. And uh, basically, what he is is that he is a Nazi sympathizer who mm -hmm. like he he wasn't like a not he wasn't like a Nazi scientist from World War Two. He's actually like. He just kind of drank the Kool Aid of the Nazis, and mm -hmm. he kind of really like he's really like your typical alt right Tea Party kind of guy. Yeah. Um, but he has the intellect and the money to kind of empower people, and he creates a character called White Power. <laughs> oh, let's see. I I hope there's not a character like. But uh, there is actually there is actually a couple of characters uh, not too f far from what you've just described, um, and uh, there's actually a couple of uh, villains. They'll be appearing in issue four, uh, who think of themselves as superheroes, but they're really just kind of like jerks that like beat semi defenseless people up, um, and posted on youtube they're basically like youtubers um with so they're basically and... aaron, aaron and logan they're basically aaron and logan paul uh yeah if logan paul was uh yeah if logan paul had like superpowers and beat people up uh for no reason and then call himself a hero yeah that's what the that's what these guys are the that's issue four um <laughs> because actually that was kind of an important idea because i wanted to be careful about how I present the government's um, position in, in in this idea. I didn't want government equal bad in this series. I um, So I wanted to kind of show, like, no, there are some assholes out there who are completely irresponsible with their powers and should not <laughs> be just out there doing what they want. Um, so I kind of wanted to, you know, start like making that case early like no there there's some guys out there you should who had should have some kind of like uh registration for um and i will go back and forth like showing you know each side of these cases all right um so out of all the villains you created what was one that you just really love uh writing or have like a favorite <laughs> Uh, well, there's one that appears in issue 11 that I really I feel like it's way too early to talk about. Um, the, is, the issue, the villain for issue 11 is really great. Um, but out of the ones that um, I can talk about right now, I guess, ooh, um, I really like Dr. Sci-Fi. He appears in issue 5. And... Uh, he is a has-been supervillain where he was a big gun. Uh, and just along the way, he just kind of fell off. And he's just kind of slumming it. Uh, and I thought it would be fun to take a mad scientist and use the other version of the word mad. He's just always irritated and, mad and angry. Um, because he believes so he, that... So he's basically I'm sorry? No, I was just going to say, so he's basically like a golden age supervillain who's kind of come out of retirement and be like, wait, I was a big deal. <laughs> well, Dr. Sci-Fi Sci is under the impression that we are about to be invaded by um, 
uh, multi-dimensional uh, beings and no one believes him like there's no such thing as a multiverse uh, as far as uh, the world knows so everyone thinks he's crazy and he doesn't care like he is going to get humanity ready uh, and sometimes he has to steal and sometimes he has to do things to repair and that causes him to be a super villain and he is just insistent on this and he hates stupid people hates them um like he's really he really does not like anti-science people at all um and he has just fallen he's just like been beaten and beaten and beaten and now he's just like literally at the when we first see him he has become uh a uh he's become the leader of a car theft ring uh, that's all he's got. Like, okay, I need some money. I need to steal some cars. <laughs> so he's hired some guys, and of course he can't help himself. So he's started, like, turning these cars into robots um, to get... That's his secret plan. Like, he's been telling his henchmen, like, oh, look, we're going to steal these cars, and we're going to, like, you know, convert them into robots and make some money. And no, his real plan is to, like, protect the world from these imaginary creatures. Um, he's a lot of fun to write. Uh, I absolutely adore writing him because he's always pissed off. I, I honestly hope you made a robots in disguise joke. I may have. I I can't remember. I because I remember reading that issue. I just forget. Like, but look, it's me. Of course, I'm going to write stupid Transformers jokes. <laughs> uh, There's you no know, way I'm not going to write Transformers jokes. <laughs> um. Speaking of which, if you ever want, if you ever go back to writing Doctor Sci-Fi again, um, for inspiration, may I suggest this um, steampunk artist by the name of Doctor Steel? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's kind of funny because his whole, like his, his whole gimmick was he's a musician, but also he wants to build an army of robots to fight aliens. Um, <laughs> yeah, and he he has a song build the robots and it's a song all about him trying to steal money however he could to build robots just go give that song build the robots a shot and it'll totally represent dr sci-fi <laughs> i have a plan I actually have a story arc in mind um actually the main heroes and villains i have like story arcs through the series like what i want these characters to start as and end at and yeah i have a plan for dr sci-fi Okay, um, I think my favorite villain you created for the ro for Red Knight's Rogues Gallery was the Bird. Yeah, Mister Bird is great. Um, he's we all also another the... character. We'll... Sorry, I was just gonna say That's we all okay. know Mister Bird is the word. That's right. No getting around it. Uh, he appears in issue six, and he is the first of the magical, creepy villains. And I had a lot of fun writing him. And. Uh, coming up with different ways because he can mentally control birds and cause them to do you know uh anything he wants them to do you know basically like if the hitchcock birds movie had a brain behind it you know uh causing the attacks um yeah he's a lot of fun too he's a bitter guy he's really just he's basically you know the world has just beaten him up and this is his chance to beat it back and it's not a not a good plan, but um, I've been coming up with interesting ideas um, for him to use birds uh, mentally, and I don't want to—I don't want to give anything away. But he—he he becomes really interesting, uh, at least from what I have uh, kind of mapped out a bit, because uh, he—he has some interesting methods of using the birds. Let's just say. All right, can't wait to see it. Um... So I guess, like, moving around from the story, it's uh, from the comic and universe itself. Um, now, obviously, and you don't have to go into total detail if you don't want to, you've hit some, you know, speed bumps here and there. Do you want to talk about, like, just the ups and downs of being a indie writer, just to let the people know, uh, people who are listening to this, in case they ever want to go into independent writing their own comics, um, just to let them know, hey, this is what you're getting into? Yeah. Uh, of course, yeah. Um, this ain't easy, and this is not exactly a huge money-making endeavor uh, if you decide to get into comics or, or even just simply uh, publishing. 
Uh, I still work paycheck to paycheck. Uh, believe it or not, um, let's see, doing comic books and doing a YouTube channel about comic books doesn't make you rich. Uh, so uh, that's been kind of the biggest issue. I've had uh, Red Knight with a couple of different uh, publishers. That's also been uh, an issue too is, uh, you know, just finding the, the right publisher uh, where you can work with. And the first one I had was Primal Paper Comics, and that was that was successful for a while. And we were kind of, in a way, we split like a rock band. We just went our separate ways. Uh, and then I was briefly connected with uh, one of the other creators through his own publishing, but uh, I ended that. And I was gonna go through uh, like a third one, but um, let's see, we kind of went our separate ways as well. So uh, I was like, you know what? <sighs> Forget this. I have, my, <laughs> I have my methods. I, I'm actually very inspired by my wife, Lindsay, who has done her own business uh, for the last few years and has been very productive and very successful with it. So I was like, you know what? I can do that. Uh, so I've decided to kind of just rip off everything I've seen her do. <laughs> and, you know, I ask her like detailed questions about how to, you know, set up businesses and stuff like that. And uh, it's been very helpful. So, uh, yeah, everything now from from now on that I'll be uh, producing um, will be under the same umbrella. Like, you know, the Red Knight comic, uh, the Davida novels, uh, the Caprice uh, stuff, um, with the exception of um, the book I do. Any of the books I do with Lindsay will be under her business. Um like Krampus in the Corner, and we're talking about another book. Uh, those would be under her business um, with Silent Orchid Studios. But it's 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 a lot of money. It's especially if you are not a writer artist, then that uh, that gets more expensive. Um, because I can't stress this enough: if you work with artists, pay the artists. Uh, you don't. You know, you have to pay the artist. You have to pay maybe the letter, the editor. Uh, a colorist if it's a different person than the artist um, and sometimes it takes some time to like find the right person find the right um, creator that works with your vision and uh, you know someone that you can like uh, you know find a good rapport with you know that's not always easy and I've been extremely lucky finding some extremely talented people uh, to work with over the years because I've heard some other people go, I can't find anybody, like, you know, over and over again, like, and I, I don't know, I feel like I kind of, you know, just almost randomly bumped into these people, and, and they've all been absolutely perfect, so uh, the biggest roadblock basically has been money, like, there have been times where I just haven't had any enough, I haven't had enough rent or revenue to, you know, produce, uh, you know, the works, and you know, that, that can be frustrating, especially when you kind of pile on stories and know what you want to do and you just can't get it there because you have to pay the rent. And like, well, I could eat or, you know, come out with issue 10. But um, that's that's the tricky part. You know, just finding, uh, find, you just, if you do, um, I, I, there's a ton of different things I can tell you to be an independent creator, but one of them, uh, outside of the creative part, the business part, is just be realistic and be patient. And don't be, don't be um, discouraged if you can't get your work out immediately because it's going to happen. Uh, something is going to hold you up. You know, life happens when you're busy making plans, and that sure is true of creating comics. So I, I just recommend just sticking with it and doing any kind of like saving you can um if you don't need to buy something don't buy it um if you can find a good deal you get that good deal but like you know you know well you know watch your savings and you know pinch your pennies and put it towards something you want to make you know you got to kind of stick with it like if you want to do it no one it's not going to happen unless you do it and that's it uh so that's that's the most complicated uh, thing about uh, doing uh, a comic. Actually, creatively, I really don't have that much trouble. I don't really get too many like um, writer blocks. Um, that's not 
been too much of a problem for me. Um, it has been a little bit of an issue with um, the second DeVita novel. I feel like I could have started that a couple of years ago, and I've done some rethinking on the book a couple times. Uh, and that's mostly due to uh, the subject matter, and I'm dealing with some serious subject matter in the second DeVita novel, and I want to make sure I don't do it in a way that's insulting um, to the people who like experience the type of things that go through the book, and you know these are not experiences I've had. So it's it's one of those things that's a little daunting. That's probably my biggest road. Uh, that's probably my biggest uh, writer's block creatively is like you know let me make sure I get this right and respectful. Because um, sometimes I, I don't like to just write frivolous things that you know could just be any like Power Ranger story. Like you know, I want to I want to do something that's really you know kind of like thoughtful. You know this is. You know, writing to me, art is, you know, communication. And this is how I, you know, see and deal with the world. And I communicate it through a goofy superhero and horror stories. And that's kind of the fun way to do it. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess that's, uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, money. Money, money, money is the biggest problem. <laughs> no, that's, uh, that's a really good, um, that was a really good answer. Thank you. Um, because this is this is not easy. As someone who's trying to be a no, uh, be a novelist, yeah. Quick, qu a quick answer. Yeah, and also it, you have to get frustrated sure. trying to do this. It, oh yeah, um, and also you're when you're when it's just you, you have to do everything. You have to publicize the thing. You have to make sure it gets out. You have to make sure it gets in people's hands. You have to uh, maybe contact. Uh, people to review it and you know bring it to attention it's like everything falls on you you can't just because you can't just like you know pay the money to get it created and put it out there and just sit back and wait for the world to like discover your genius because algorithms don't care and you got to make people care you got to you got to put it in people's hands and go this shit's awesome check it out uh, you got to <laughs> go to the conventions and all that stuff yeah, totally. Um, you know, and I've, I'm sure I've told you this story, but for the, for those out there listening, um, I published a while ago a short story for a, for, a, for a young publishing group, but it was done in, I'd say, March, and the book's still not out because the just authors and, I mean, excuse me, the editors uh, were just small, and they were very slow on everything. I understand that the the editor chief was kind of um, contro over controlling things, um, out of respect for everybody. I'm not going to name names, but it actually took one of my friends to kind of jump in and do the editing, and it's it's nearly done. Like it's coming out next month, um, hopefully That's early great. next month. Yeah, but the point is, is that you're going to get screwed. Let's let's also not get. I'm pretty sure you agree with me that you know sometimes, you know these edit you know these indie groups are like oh yeah we're all in the same boat we're all gonna be friends no you're not that's correct um i have been i don't know what to say fully screwed but i've been like uh i you know i've had like things get in the way of you know the creative part uh with working with some people and i've seen worse cases where i chose not to go with other creative people i've seen you know what happens there um it's it's tricky that that that's why that's why being your own boss has its advantages and disadvantages like you know it'd be cool if i found a publisher to do red knight with and they could do all that work that'd be great so i could just like sit back and just do the thing i want to do um but that's uh not likely in the horizon so it's like okay all right i just it's just something i just have to accept as part of the the process like you know um it's work but you know what you could look at it as fun work i mean look you know i've done a retail job i've done uh food service um 
I've done like real heavy manual labor. And you know what? Calling stores about carrying your comic book, uh, that's kind of fun work. <laughs> you know, that's, I can think of worse jobs than uh, going to conventions and um, you know, sending your work to get reviewed. Uh, that's, that's not bad. No, totally. Um, and also, I want to stress to the to the listeners out there: I'm we're not trying to follow. It, all we're saying is, don't go in blind. Yeah. Well, look, you if know. you go in blind, um, you're setting yourself up for major disappointment and possibly being so discouraged you stop doing the thing you love, and you got to be aware of that. It, you know, circling back to Red Knight, you know, I don't think I purposely tried to do this, but Tom McLean's journey in being a superhero and getting into this culture is very similar to me trying to create and trying to write and be a comic book writer. Um, I, I guess I've like subconsciously channeled um, that energy and those feelings into what he's doing like he's trying so hard to get into the thing he loves and he wants to do it so bad and he can't catch a break um and he does catch minor breaks but it's really every like victory is a small victory um and like oh wait that's i guess i'm kind of <laughs> thinly veiling you know my own uh, you know feelings about you know trying to start a writing career so um, yeah, it's just yeah, just do your do your best not to set yourself up for disappointment. Yeah, that's if you're not careful, you're going to end up hating what you love, and that's not fun. Um, oh no, that's the worst thing you want to do. No. Yeah. Um, and then you're just going to live with regret, and regret is the worst feeling, I gotta say. Yeah, because you know what? I, I can't I can't imagine if I just stopped. Like, I wouldn't stop thinking about what I want to write. You know, that doesn't go away. Uh, I'd still be plagued with these characters. Actually, I did take a, a break. There was, like, in the mid-90s, I just kind of, like, gave up and decided to try and write a couple other things. But these characters, this universe did not leave me alone. Uh, I've been, I think there was like five, ten years uh, where I wasn't like actively working on them. They were still there, and uh, uh, that's kind of how it uh, goes. It's like they stick around. So the best way to kind of like uh, purge them is to just do it. Just create. Just create. Look, if you're a writer, if you're an artist, you're you're already done. You are a writer and artist. Uh, Keep making, keep making stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's uh, yeah, because the worst thing you can do is just yeah, it's to just stop. Um, you still, yeah, um, yeah, I'm still here. yeah. Okay, I was just, I was afraid we we lost connection. Um, so I guess since we've talked about Red Knight, um, do you want to go into a little bit of your horror novel, Davida? Uh, yeah, that's something I haven't pub publicized enough, and I, it's totally my fault. I've been focused on this other thing, um, and I do kind of neglect my horror novel. I, to be honest, um, it's taken me a while to accept the fact that I think it's good, uh, <laughs> because I keep asking, like, people who read it, like, is this good? Are you, are you sure it's good? And they're going, no, what are you talking about? Shut up. Um, Davida is a... Uh, horror novel it's a vampire novel uh, i initially wanted to do it as a comic but it just kind of became a novel because i just that's where the story went and it's about a married pair of vampires who are in the 1950s uh, uh, 1960s and they have uh three human children uh they uh, become vampires with their human kids in tow and they eventually move to New York City in the 70s and open up a disco, uh, which is great for them. Everything's uh, working out until the mafia wants a piece of their business, and they tell them, no, fuck you, we're vampires. We're not going to 
worry about you. And the Mafia doesn't really take that well. Uh, so the Mafia sicks the Catholic Church on them. Uh, and that begins uh, the big epic journey of our uh, vampires, uh, Dominic and Lucia de Vida, our... Uh, are the lead characters and they go on this quest to kind of like find a way to beat back these uh, vampire hunters that are trying to kill them and it's a quest of them doing everything they can to save their family and their business so they can keep eating people <laughs> and, uh, so yeah oh i was gonna I, I didn't know if you had more but i was gonna ask so for Davida, was there any like inspiration from like Hammer, uh, from like the Hammer films, or was there some other form of inspiration for you? Because I was like, yeah, this is this could totally be a Hammer film. God, I had a lot of ins- inspirations, and they all kind of like came together when I started like uh, getting the ball rolling on this. Like, um, I thought it'd be fun to do like a story about a creepy family, like the Adams family. Um, I had this idea sitting in my head forever with Red Knight about a, a, a mafia uh, a mafia family that were vampires. Um, I also had this other idea that I was totally going to put in the Red Knight universe, and I, I plucked it out and put it in the novel of uh, the Catholic Church's army of vampire hunters and monster hunters. Um, and they all kind of just fell into place. Um... There's a lot of what um, there's a lot of real life inspiration uh, of family, and yeah, there's everything I've kind of liked about horror uh, is in here. Everything, it's the horror vampire novel I I've always wanted to see. It's the vampire movie I kind of wanted to see uh, that I've never seen because every vampire movie I've ever seen, there's like, eh, that was okay. There was a couple ideas they should have played with and they never did and it's more about what i haven't seen that was the inspiration like oh man this would be so cool if they do all these things and they don't no no one ever does um so like there's other monsters there's plenty of creatures in here um because we take a trip through a magical dark journey through uh, the land of new jersey (laughs) And that's, all, encounter... and that's already a, a and that's already like a no man's land of monsters as it is. It is. I treat it like that, and uh, like that's where they run into like werewolves and uh, succubus, uh, and incubus. I guess you call them incubi or succubi. Uh, no, it's incubus. Fairies. It's incubus. Yeah, they run into fairies and all kinds of other creatures um, on this journey to save their family. So. Um, it's a lot. It, this was a lot of fun, uh, really. Um, so, to, so to further expand, like for the readers, um, in case they want to check out Davida, like, what are your vampires like? Like, what are the kind of like? Are they kind of like like Bale Lugosi? Can they transform? Can they, like, you know, be? I, are, are they? I, I had this idea that uh, power wise, uh, the older you are as a vampire, the more you can do. Like you. If you're a brand new vampire, it's kind of like a Buffy vampire. Yeah, if you're a brand new vampire, within a few years, you're like a Buffy vampire. You just eat people, and you're more susceptible to sunlight. But if you're a little older, a little more experienced, kind of like Dragon Ball Z, um, you can do the Dracula stuff. You can turn into bats and wolves and mist, and you can walk around uh, at a low-level power during the day. Um, and my, my vampire, Dominic, uh, Dominic is this kind of like real, like loving family man, uh, but he's stern and he's powerful. And Lucia DeVita is, oh man, how do I describe her? She is a, an Italian gypsy vampire disco queen and uh she has a lot of angry passionate energy and she doesn't like she can't pretend (laughs) to save her life like she is who she is and you got to deal with it 
Uh, and, you know, if she likes you, if she loves you, you know, she'll go all the way to the ends of the earth for you. But if if she doesn't like you, you're in trouble. Um, and uh, she's easily the most foul-mouthed of the characters in the book. And I, I enjoyed writing her quite a bit. So so essentially, she's she's like every Italian woman. Uh, maybe, yeah. And I don't uh, mean... I've, I've known a few. <laughs> <laughs> that's and, not uh, like for people like who like um they're like oh that's that's uh, that's too stereotypical no it's not you haven't met my grandmother <laughs> that's right and it's done lovingly i really uh i love the character and i i think well, a lot of these attributes can be positive uh, even if the people she's pulling apart with her bare hands wouldn't agree yeah Oh, it's, um, it's very violent. This is a very violent. Uh, don't think this is a like a kid friendly book. It's, um, it's a very uh, violent and uh, sexual book. <laughs> there's there's a lot of killing, a lot of fucking, uh, in a story about family. Read about folks. Hmm. No, I was just going to say, oh, isn't that what it's really all about? <laughs> yeah, it is. You know, when you were talking about vampires earlier and how you kind of, like, use the whole thing of, well, they start out as, like, nor like your normal Buffy vampires or 30 Days of Night vampires and kind of grow in themselves. That's actually, like, how I... this, But if you do some training, later on you're going to be able to, like, control storms and shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of how I thought of it. And the second half of the book is them realizing we need to be more powerful. So are there any shortcuts we can do uh, to get more powerful? That's that's a big chunk of the book right there, of them going on this quest to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. Like, I also had a story, but it's kind of set in that same time period. And I really should write it out one day. It's just... This idea of set in the of the uh, 20s, you know, the era of like when the gangsters were at, were at their just high point in New York. Um, I had this idea of this uh, group of uh, of this uh, this group of Jewish boys who are actually werewolves, and their uh, their their little corner is being oppressed by the by the mafia, and they're like, "No, fuck you guys, we're werewolves. Let's let's <laughs> uh, let's fight and protect." Yeah. You know, the idea, um, like the story's name, the Wolf Gang. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Back to oh no, slightly back to superheroes. A friend of mine, uh, Daniel Caliban, um, is doing um, a uh, comic book series called American Dream, set in uh, 1900. And what's neat about that is he is kind of relating the Jewish immigrant experience. Uh, through a superhero tale where his character is a young Jewish immigrant who gets uh, zapped through an experiment uh, and he becomes like 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 Superman level powerful um, and his book is like like all about that and it's really uh, it's really interesting how all any goes on that and that's that's a real nice that's a real good way to kind of like um, like to develop a story uh, you know so it's just not hey guy gets powers like no no this is this is where this character is coming from that is awesome um i'm gonna have to check that out yeah it's a really good um, book i think that's all the questions i have um i have one more for uh for funsies sure what do, what do you got i had a whole ton of well, I was trying to say, like, um, I had a whole ton of, a ton of interviews from Megacon I had, but uh, those all got lost, so I'm glad I could actually do this and ask this question. Um, so, here's a big and in Marvel or DC. Is there any characters you'd love to write, and if so, like, what would your run be for that character? Oh, boy. Um, I've mentioned this a few times. Um, if I... Because uh, I'm just, I, every like fan and writer like thinks about their dream jobs, and like 
I actually a few years ago started thinking like, well, what if I got a book that I didn't want to write? But of course, like, if Marvel goes, hey, we got a book for you, you'll take it. So I started thinking about like, what would I do? Like, I hate the Punisher. What would I do if like they gave me the Punisher? Um, and I started thinking about like, oh, well, why don't we make that work? Why, why don't why don't we make like the things I don't like about them like the attributes of the series? And I would like tell stories from the perspectives of like the criminals he goes after and I would kind of like do him up like a slasher villain uh, and go all in on the idea and make him really scary uh, because I mean that's what made him popular in the first place is being really violent and scary and then we realized like whoa that's a little irresponsible <laughs> so we pulled it back and that's <laughs> less fun so um, I thought well let's go in let's you know, because I've thought of, like, different ideas. Like, you know, uh, I can make, like, you know, the lead characters and different characters of, you know, each story arc and stuff like that. And kind of, like, go really scary with them. Um, I, have of course, would love to write, uh, like, Spider-Man and Daredevil. They're big heroes of mine. Uh, She-Hulk, I'm a big nut for. Um, and I would definitely have a lot of fun with, like, the balance of being a superhero and a lawyer. That just... That's just too fun not to write. Um, and I've been recently thinking about how much fun I would have with uh, Captain Marvel. Because I think I would like... She has some villains that don't appear very much. Like every once in a while, like one will come back. And like uh, like Mystique was one of her villains originally. Like she appeared in like her comic in the, in the 70s. Um, I would kind of like, you know, give her a more like substantial like... Uh, rogues gallery and kind of build that up uh with dc of course anybody would love to write like wonder woman batman or superman but i would kill to write uh cassandra kane um and like establish her with a real superhero identity and name and um kind of almost make her the like a daredevil type um and just have go nuts with her crazy kung fu abilities because uh, that's one of the things I like so much about her original run. Well, she would do these awesome things <laughs> in the book. Uh, and it would just be like story arc after story arc. They'd be like, okay, how can we top this cool thing she did? Uh, and I would definitely try to play with that. Uh, and I guess since DC just brought back uh, Wesley Dodd's Sandman, I would love to do something with him. Or question. I love that kind of mysterious... Um, like uh, pulpy type of heroes uh, in a trench coat, which is, I guess, why I put Red Knight in a trench coat. <laughs> uh, so I get, get those are basically the um, the ones I would definitely like to do at Marvel DC. Those are at least my answers over and over again uh, when I think about it. I if like if I ever got to write characters for Marvel or DC, I think for DC, like the one I'd like to write the most is probably Raven. Oh, Raven's an interesting choice. Yeah, Raven, like, as an ongoing or a miniseries, um, I would like to just really explore, like, that character and her um, just mental state, because we never go into it of, like, hey, my dad's a freaking demon god, and we never go into her <laughs> and her mental state. Like, they have, like, George Perez has a few times, but we never have gone, like, really in-depth of how that affects her. Yeah. Hey, what's her... I've never seen her mother in anything. What's her mother... Is she alive? Is she dead? Do we know her? You know, they... You know, I don't know what it is in the new continuity of the 52 <laughs> slash rebirth kind of thing, but I do know that um, her mom was alive for a while, but I think she died in the previous continuity, if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong, but I would actually hey, love cool. to... Blank, Blank yeah, slate. Blank slate. You can do that. And I'd also love to have um, her and Beast Boy get back together. That always seem to oddly work. I don't know why. Yeah. Um, I would also like to write Secret Six. Um, That's or awesome. Su I just like to do... And for Marvel, this just sounds so weird, but I, I'd love to write... I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Oh, I'd, um, I'd like to write something with the Hobgoblin. Oh, yeah. Uh, the original Hobgoblin? 
well, any, like, I even thought of, like, a whole run focusing on a new Hobgoblin of, um, <laughs> like, the, the whole run would be, because that's what I liked about the Hobgoblin is that he could be anybody. Like, it's a, so I thought of this guy who builds himself up as a crime lord in, like, the Northwest, like, somewhere in Oregon, because a lot of villains are like, well, Kingpin and all these big names are, like, taking over. Let's move, let's expand. It's like, let's go somewhere where there aren't superheroes or big name crime lords. So they're all, like, gathering in the northwest in that area and this guy who builds himself as a crime lord of this local town he's not really a villain he's actually like trying to protect his town by pretending to be a villain and subsequently pretend to be the hobgoblin mm -hmm. so it'd be this yeah, whole, I don't know. it'd be kind of like breaking bad in a way yeah i don't know why these stupid idiot villains don't go somewhere else yeah <laughs> there's um there's a Miss Marvel story where the Shocker decides to go to Jersey City um, <laughs> and kind of start over. He's yeah. like, well, there's just one hero here, and you know, she's just some stupid teenager. Uh, I'm going to go here and make my name. <laughs> that one's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we got everything covered. Um, uh, so any final words? or? Uh... Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll do a little plugging here. Um, By all means, quite... plug. Yes, uh, I don't quite know when this video will post, uh, but uh, Red Knight will officially, uh, after the Kickstarter, uh, I've sent the Kickstarter uh, comics out to the, the backers. So the book's going to come out officially for everybody September 30th. Uh, that's where you can uh, buy the comic either in print or digital on manospublishing.com. And you can also buy uh, the DaVita novel on manospublishing.com. And it's also available on Amazon, by the way. Um, if you uh, like the comics, if you like the novel, uh, you can uh, give it ratings on like Goodreads and on Amazon. If, uh, I will also be attending some conventions. Um, I'm going to be at the Chesapeake Central Library's Monster Fest uh, October, what is it, 5th? 5th, I think. Well, it's the first Saturday of October. And uh, at a bigger show, I'm going to be at Baltimore Con. I'm going to be at Baltimore Con the 18th through the 20th. Uh, and I'm going to be alongside of another great uh, comic book creator, um, Alex uh, Breen. He's uh, one of the editors on Red Knight. He has this awesome comic of him, himself uh, called From Within. Uh, we're going to be sharing a table. So it's probably going to be listed uh, on the map and the menus, uh, Alec Breen's table, but I will be there too, uh, selling Red Knight. So uh, those are the first two big things I'll be doing. Uh, also, Red Knight 2, I even have scheduled, it's going to be a quarterly book. So Red Knight 2 comes out in December. So uh, it'll be available. All right, awesome. And as always, if you want to check out Red Knight or or DeVita subsequently. Um, I guess we'll leave, we will leave. Yeah, I'll leave, uh, I'll leave, uh, the link of, uh, the website. Okay. That, that, yeah, that, that makes more sense. You see, why is it that I always think of the hard way first? I don't understand. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, so thank you so much, Manos, uh, for your time. And, uh, as always, thank you for joining the universe. Yes. Uh, thank you, man, for um, doing this interview. I really appreciate it. And it's fun to talk about the uh, characters and the process a little bit. Absolutely. Um, it's, you know, it was just a no-brainer to talk to you um, and about your process. And, you know, hopefully we've brought more of a spotlight to your work that deserves more, you know, deserves, weight, deserves a ton of attention because I think it's great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That's nice to hear. Yes, and to everyone here, uh, on behalf of Manos and myself, we will see you right here once more in the universe.